Hi, I'm Gesa Zimmer. I'm the director of the City Science Lab in Hamburg. We have been here since 2015, so we have been one of the first city science labs in this great network. And I'm very excited that we are still here. So we are like 30 researchers in our lab. And uh, we have hosted the City Science Summit in 2019. And I know how it feels to be the host of this great uh, conference. So I'm happy that it takes place in Taipei now. And we just released this wonderful book here from our City Science Summit. And there are a lot of contributions from a lot of team members, researchers from our our great network. So have a look at this book. It just um, it has just been published. Deva Newman, the new director of the MIT Media Lab, welcome Thank to you. our fifth annual City Science Summit that we call Cities Within. So first of all, what do you see as unique and interesting to you about the Media Lab? Oh, thanks Ken. I'm so glad to be here. The Media Lab, what, what drew me in is, uh, I think it's just the most creative, uh, multi inter transdisciplinary lab at MIT. And then people are pretty action-oriented, so we want to be also offering up solutions to, to everyone and with everyone, with, with your work especially. It's the co-creating. Hmm. With respect to your own personal research interests, what are you most passionate about? Right now, personally, in terms of research, as you might know, I'm a rocket scientist, so I've always been thinking literally about moonshots and getting humanity to become interplanetary. What does that mean? We are going to have humanity going to the moon and Mars. I really have to say the most important thing I can be thinking about is climate and living in balance and harmony with all of humanity. Mm. Uh, we're all astronauts because we all live on this spaceship together. So right now thinking a lot about climate and sustainability. Yeah. You know, cities account for something like 70 percent of the CO2 emissions on the planet. In fact, I have come to believe that we will not address climate change unless we find a new model for cities. I wonder if you agree with that. I do, because you've, you've taught me well, but <laughs> I love uh, you know, how you title it, cities within. Yeah. So it really is thinking about within our urban environments, and if there's a billion people now, and that climbs to 3.5 billion, then that's a game changer. So what we do at the Media Lab is how can we have the most societal impact yeah. Well, then this has to be the key to climate because we're talking about billions of people. We are probably at a tipping point. How do we reduce emissions? How do we worry still about quality of life, access, all these things? And um, well, we can do that within cities. That's, that's what I'm so excited about. They're kind of new, novel ways to, to look. We'll need uh, to change behavior. Yeah. But then we need new creative technologies and solutions, you know, system solutions. There's kind of two camps that I see, or at least at the extremes. One says that we have to change behavior, we have to dramatically reduce consumption. At the other end of the spectrum, there are people that say, well, uh, energy use is going up dramatically. It's very difficult to change behavior. We should just build a bunch of nuclear reactors and, and just focus on the supply side. So. Absolutely, we need to change behavior and reduce consumption for the developed world. For the developing nations, the energy usage is in the rise, as it should be. Right? The vast majority of people live within 100 kilometers of the coast. So to me, look at it holistically, thinking about the ocean systems mm -hmm. and climate, because that's where the sink is, that's what's absorbing so much of the carbon now. So I think we have to think of Earth subsystems, ocean, land, air, and it's really, you know, kind of the whole cycle of climate. Yeah. But what's the right mix? So it seems like a really big challenge. <laughs> People get overwhelmed, I know. Yeah. But what you're doing is so fantastic because you're offering solutions, co-created. People can move the knobs and dials and say, oh, if we do this, here's the change. If I can do this. So I think that's really empowering. 
Yeah, though I think that that's exactly right. I mean, people do get really overwhelmed, but I yeah I think there are things that people can do in their local community that, if scaled globally, could make a big difference. Yeah, I think that's where we start. Your idea is about in the community, give people, empower people, give them yeah. options, show them you know that different future. I think everyone's going to be on board, and then I really do believe in kind of the test beds and the great examples. So let's do it here in Cambridge. I know you're working right. with your whole, you yeah. know, all your communities, international communities. But if we just start, and you've already started, of course, these great examples, then there's going to be a lot of followers. Right. Say, hey, they can do it in Cambridge, Mass. But where else? Good. They can do it in Shanghai, right? Can we do it in Bangkok? See really good examples, and that's another way to really scale it. Mm. Let's talk about one detail. So top priority of the current administration is a transition to electric vehicles. There's another alternative, which is to get rid of commuting, for example. I mean, a huge source of CO2 emissions is commuting. Uh, surveys of the young people working in all the tech companies in Kendall Square would love to live within a few minute walk of where they work. I you know. love the idea. No one probably really wants to commute. So if you have the services and you can walk to work or bike to work, that is so convenient. And it also, it's a much more social. It's yeah. much more social if you're spending all your time commuting. You're not necessarily having coffee or enjoying a walk around the river. So I think this hits, it is a changing human behavior, but all for the positive and the benefits are for quality of life really increases. Mm. Maybe it's going back, right? <laughs> back mm. to the future because we're going mm. past. Because that used to be a lot of, you know, living in the village community, a real community. Mm. And I think we have lost that sense of community and I can't wait to get it back. Well, building housing for faculty and students and staff on or near campus is not a priority for MIT. Do you think it should be? Absolutely. I and mean, I love to envision a state where our community, our academic community, that we could be co-located. But boy, to pull in researchers and staff and faculty and everyone, that would be something, because that would be the entire community would uh, really thrive, I believe. What is the role of design in, <laughs> with respect to what we've been talking about? Yeah. So everything's about design, right? <laughs> we have to um, design the framework, literally design the systems. There's the physical design as well. I think there's kind of the data and the information to me that, that all revolves around design. Then there's the um, literal, you know, physical design, if we talk about communities and being able to, to live together and live in close proximity. And then there's the aesthetic part of design I need to mention as well, because if we're talking about quality of life and living together, the aesthetics are so important. The designers need to be included in the discussion mm -hmm. right up front, because we know when that's not the case, things um, can be you know not designed well and human use human interaction mm. usability so all those case studies and incremental design i think are really important mm. how what is the role of education and yeah. learning at the media lab yeah in, that, in, in terms of these grand challenges that we all have to face yeah so the education piece is first just the knowledge piece the mm. education piece and doing it you know problem solving that's usually when students are at their best Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much discipline oriented, it's the grand challenge, climate, and you bring students together from very different backgrounds. We're fortunate, that's how we kind of have the students mm -hmm. from all different backgrounds and offer up the problem, you know, climate. And we also, you know, our nature of the students, they're makers and they're doers. So give them the problem, but, but let them get their hands dirty, literally. Mm -hmm. You know, let them get their hands dirty and say, how would we go about this? And this generation of students, they get it. So. That's the good news. We're not convincing anyone. Students are usually ahead of us, in my experience. So the students are out there, but we're we're like the coaches, you know. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, you know, say what about this scenario? What about that scenario? And um, so I'm optimistic. I think that the leadership, climate and all, will come from our students. It'll be the you know our students yeah. now, the future generations. It means that we have to help lead now and help facilitate the education, bringing the communities together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So data is the fuel of just about everything we're going to do, and a, and a lot of the best data related to human behavior is locked down by corporations that use it for their own proprietary interests. How can we get access to such 
data that can be used for the public good to solve some of these societal yeah. problems? That's a great question. When I was at the government and NASA, we were very proud of our open data initiatives. They were they were huge, and that's exactly what governments should do. Open data is public. You know, it's paid by mm -hmm. for the taxpayer. So we do have a large, large open data movement from the government. Of course, open source, the open source movement, and at the media levels, so we've always been really proud about that our data is open. And so I think it is a conversation with industry as well. Let's have that conversation. That's a tough conversation, but let's say we see the whole internet of things, but using the data for the benefit of humanity, and that necessarily means that we want it to be open and open access. And so I think it is incumbent upon us to, to work with our industry colleagues to see where we can work and we can get to the happy medium. Yep. Surely, I you know envision hybrid systems that are mostly open, 80% open, we're sharing data, all the climate data of course should be shared, most of it's collected by the government, governments, world governments. Um, okay, if you need to lock down for security and other reasons, you might need to lock down a platform, but I think that that's 10, 20%. So I do see really, you know, platforms that um, really have open data architecture. Mm -hmm. Problems in places like Boston are challenging enough, but even more challenging in my opinion are the billions of people who live in informal settlements without access to housing, a clean, good housing, clean water, uh, communication, sanitation, etc. What technology or systems or ideas from NASA related work could be used to solve these problems in the informal settlement? Thanks. It's great to think about informal settlements. Again, this is billions of people, and then it wouldn't be obvious to say, well, what does space technology have to do with it? But I, it's a, such a great question because some of the solutions to make informal settlements really thrive is not, we know this, it's not to replicate the electrical grid and what mm -hmm. we're doing in other urban environments. So it calls for innovation calls for us to be really creative because those are probably new solutions. Those are new evolving solutions that work within the informal settlements. So now thinking about space technology and data, say clean water would be my, my first great example. Mm -hmm. We do you know closed loop life support systems in very confined environments in space on International Space Station getting ready for Moon and Mars. So water, uh, we need really 100% closed loop systems. So the wa water filtration, clean water, every liquid up on space station and i mean every liquid all your coffee all your extra you know everything from the bathroom all the liquids those are totally recycled guess what it comes out as drinking water so just the water filters have been scaled and the earth application is fresh water so you can go in one of the dirtiest dirtiest rivers or water sources put it through really advanced filters and get out clean water now your question, how do we scale that? How do we make, how do we democratize it? How do we give that technology to everyone? So I think that some of these technologies though from space are really important for informal settlements because they're small, they're compact. Mm -hmm. We have to get them less expensive and we have to make sure we have billions of them. But when we talk about water and power, same thing now when we talk about power generation, it's probably, it's not just extending the grid. It's like, no, what are the, what are the own little micro grids there? And what are the power sources? You and I have talked about a lot. Sure, there's renewables and solar works a lot of places, wind works some places, but nuclear, what about, you know, maybe people don't know for space, how do we get to Mars? How do we, we do use nuclear batteries. Mm -hmm. that, that is part of space. And they have to be safe, of course, but these are really high density, powerful, and I think of it as, again, kind of mobile and modular. So you can put things, you can bring things to the places that you need them. So how do we adapt and scale? NASA technology to be used for informal settlement. Yeah, well, that's where that's where the commercialization comes in from a lot of those, uh, even the government patents, a lot of the advanced technology. The great thing about, you know, for NASA, those, those technologies for water filtration, a lot of the sensing, they are open and actually in the tech portal we can just go to and companies, new startups, lots of our students, they can come and actually have that technology. A lot of those patents are for free. The government's mm -hmm. already paid for them, but um, you know, government doesn't commercialize things, so it's a great opportunity for young entrepreneurs to come along and say, that does look like a great technology, and here's how I would love to use it in, say, our example of the informal settlement. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, I think, kind of the opportunity that lies ahead of us. Yeah. How do we take some of that technology, how do we commercialize it and scale it, you know, in an affordable fashion? Yeah. Do you think we can do that here at the Media Lab? I hope so. <laughs> we have a jump start on it with our E14 fund. That's really what yeah, we're absolutely. trying to do. We're trying to take a look at the great ideas from the lab. Soon as uh, you know, our students are 
our alum and think about, okay, how these are great ideas. You know, we have more great ideas that we can definitely fund, but some of them are going to change the world. Well, climate, back to climate, it's, it's, what do you think is the Media Lab's unique contribution to climate research? I've been thinking about that recently. So what can the Media Lab do? For the Media Lab specifically, I love uh, you know, our idea of the hyper-local. So we're, we're about the world. We're about serving the world and globally, from my perspective as a space person, the global perspective, we have the satellite data. But then when we get down to it and have a conversation with people, it's that hyper-local. Locally, what can we do? We're showing people lots of different options, you know, moving the sliders, mm -hmm. uh, moving, tweaking the dials, moving the DOMs, as I say. And that's really at the local, this hyper-local focus. And we have to have the global, holistic perspective to say, we're all on this spaceship together. We're all crew. Mm -hmm. You know, my crewmate is, is you. My crewmate is in Asia. My crewmate is in Europe. But then when the work gets done, I love, uh, again, kind of your idea and articulation of the hyper-local. I think we have this decade to try to get this right. Then 10 years hence, we'll say, yeah, we got, we got that right. You know, we moved the needle. We brought the communities together. We looked within and came up with some of these solutions. So I hope that's, on, that's the journey that we're on. Exciting. Yeah. Thank you, David. Oh, thank you.